good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director of Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Cameron Scott in support of Watershed in conversation tonight with Jerry Dennis. First, a quick overview of webinars for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Watershed from Literati Bookstore. Uh, we can ship it to you anywhere in the country in the United States, and we're also available to have books picked up curbside. There's also a link to purchase below if you're watching, watching, watching us later, excuse me, on YouTube. And you can submit questions for the Q&A using the Q&A feature available to you at the bottom of your screen at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of Cameron and Jerry's conversation. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com. Uh, for curbside pickup or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. In lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on uh, where and when in the world you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Born in Colorado, Cameron Scott holds an MFA in poetry from the University of Arizona, teaches seventh to 11th grade English language arts in Wallowa, Oregon, and spends his summers as a fly fishing guide. His lyrical essays and poems have appeared in magazines, journals, and periodicals, most recently in Fly Fishing and Tying Journal, Swing the Fly, the Fly Fish Journal, and Tail Fly Fishing Magazine. In 2016, he was awarded the Blue Light Book Award for his second book of poetry, The Book of Cold Mountain. His most recent collection, Watershed, is a collection of poems and prose centered on fly fishing. He's gratefully received residencies over the years through Colorado Art Ranch, Shulquin Visions in Progress, Playa, Pataculum, and Fish Trap. And speaking with him this evening, Jerry Dennis's essays, poems, and short fiction have appeared in more than 100 publications, including the New York Times, Smithsonian, Audubon, American Way, Gray Sporting Journal, Pank, and the Michigan Quarterly Review. His books, many of them illustrated by artist Glenn Wolf, are widely acclaimed, have won numerous awards, and have been translated into Chinese, Japanese, German, Portuguese, Czech, and Korean. They can't hear you, but they can sense it through the power of the internet. So from your homes, uh, please, through a round of applause, silent round of applause, join me in welcoming Jerry Dennis and Cameron Scott into your living rooms. Well, I think I'll jump right in then. Thanks, John. And Cam, it's nice to meet you virtually. I've been really enjoying your book. Um, it's created a little bit of stress for me because I cannot read good fishing stories or poetry without wanting to go fishing. And this is a really bad time of year to do it here in Northern Michigan. Um, the question, of course, that I have to ask that every writer always wants to ask another writer is, how did you get started? But in your case, how did you get started fishing? And how did you get started with, with poetry and essays? Awesome. Uh, thanks for that question, Jerry, and awesome to be here. Um, you know, uh, like a lot of people, I got started in fishing. It was a it was a family. It was culturally kind of central to my family. My grandpa was an English teacher in Minnesota, and uh, in the Brainerd Lakes area, every every summer I'd go up there and fish um, with the hand line at first for sunfish and brim and then later on, you know, pike and bass and smallmouth and largemouth. And I guess I, I never knew that rivers existed. I would wait all year long to go to Minnesota to fish. And I was growing up in Colorado. And uh, I think later on in my teenage years, I had moved to Battleground, Washington, which is just south of Mount St. Helens. And uh, my buddy, Corey, grew up in a fly fishing family. And he, one day he was like, let's go fish. I said, awesome, which lake are we gonna go fish? He's like, no, we're gonna go fish this place called Canyon Creek. I was like, you're crazy. And so I took my spin rod and some uh, little daredevils and things like that and watched him fly fish all day long. And at the end of it, uh, asked if I could take a couple casts and it was just over at that point for me. The line had floated, the fly floated, a little creek chub came up and tried to eat it. And uh, for me, that was, 
there was no other way from that point on that I really wanted to fish. Um, so that was, that was fishing for me. And then with, with writing, I'd always, I was always a reader when I was a kid, loved to read books. And I think like a lot of writers, um, I started wanting to emulate and imitate what I saw. And so just, uh, it got me through high school. High school is always an interesting time of life. And for some reason, I found that writing really helped me order my thoughts. And um, it really built the, the base and platform for all the writing I've done since then. Hmm. Yeah. And, and was poetry your um, direction all along as a writer? It always, you know, just naturally, it always has been. Sometimes I kind of change lanes over into lyrical essays. I really enjoy lyrical essays as well. But for the most part, uh, I've always just naturally gravitated towards poetry. I love lines and phrases and line breaks and breaths and musicality of poetry. I always think of poetry as kind of a triangle where you have metaphor and you have music and then you have narrative and lyric. And those three things are working together. And I just you know, I can, I'm also lazy, so I can get a poem written in an hour where with prose sometimes, especially if I'm trying to write a novel, uh, you know, just days go by and then weeks go by and months go by. And I really like to be able to go fish all day and also write or uh, teach all day. And when I come home from teaching to be able to write for, so for some reason, I just love that. I always think of poetry as sprinting and I just love those short, brief sprints into thought and seeing where the where a poem leads, what a poem wants to become. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's well put. I've always thought of it as um, as the writing that takes place in the spaces between stories. And for me, both literally the stories that I write, articles, essays, and stories. I got my start as a as an outdoor writer, writing fishing stories for field and stream and sports and field and outdoor life. And um, stories were what I wanted to write. And fishing is, you know, ready made for it. There's a beginning, a middle and an end. And it's, um, it just unfolds naturally. But there isn't always a story. There, there's gaps in the, in the events and nothing, there's long periods when nothing happens, nothing major happens. And that's where suddenly poetry can come alive. And I noticed that in your poems is your attention to detail uh, is pretty extraordinary the things that you notice, do you intentionally set out every day with that in mind to be one who doesn't miss anything? Uh, no, definitely not. Uh, I miss plenty in life. Um, but I do think that poetry is a way of being present. You know, I think writing in general is a way of being present. And so it's been, a, it's been something that I've been able to do to be more present in life. And there are times as a writer where everything about the world just becomes huge. And, you know, a hand, for example, when you look at a hand, like it becomes fathomless. And so, um, you know, for me that those details, you know, poetry is just a way of capturing those details. And, you know, I, uh, you know, there, was, there were fly fishing authors. I read, read a lot of essays when I was um, growing up by fly, fish, by fly fishing authors. And then I found some poetry by John Engels. Uh, and then uh, discovered Michael Delp. And it really, like you were saying, Jerry, poetry is a way of getting at those in-between times when nothing really, nothing spectacular is happening, right? There's not a huge huge plot twist. There's not necessarily a, um, you know, it's not action driven or narrative driven, but there's so much to notice out there on rivers. You know, I, one of the things um, just from some reading of your work that I've done, just that idea, right, that we're rooted in place. And when you find yourself rooted in a place that's surrounded by water, there's just, there's just so much to see, I think. There's so much to be captured by, right? You're surrounded on all sides by it. And it's, it's not land though. You know, you can't live in it. Um, I don't know. 
do you, you know, when I, it makes me think about the poets that I read and uh, just writers in general um, with landscape, you know, that role of landscape that has in our writing, uh, you know, and, and having not, I, I don't know if I've ever been to Michigan, um, but I can go there through reading, you know, uh, like one of your books, for example, and I'm there and I'm, and I'm on different waterways or I'm meeting different people and, you know, seeing those things. Do you find that, uh, do you ever, do you gravitate toward poetry, I guess, while you're writing prose? You know, I always have written poetry. Um, I never considered myself a, a true poet though, because it was, um, it was something I did to warm up in the mornings, it would get the language center agitated, you know, <laughs> get some sparks flying. And it, it took me quite a few years to even consider um, showing anybody. Um, but as I've gotten older, um, I've really welcomed it. It has brought a lot of um, precision and clarity to me and my work. It's helped me in, in countless ways, not only writing it, but reading it as well. I've always read it, but I'm reading it in the last 10 years, I've started reading it with a real hunger, the kind of hunger I've always had for, for prose. And um, it's opened up, you know, whole, whole realms of, of authors that I wasn't aware of, like John Engels. Mike Delp, who's a good friend of mine, and you will have to come to Michigan and fish with us. Um, yeah. you know, Mike's a great, a great um, mentor in that way to, to guide me toward other other writers that he thinks I should read and of course to compare to swap poems with each other and, and talk about them. I was really delighted to see that you you've got a one of Mike's gazelles as the frontispiece part of the frontispiece on your book and I, I thought wow you must know him and but you, apparently you don't you haven't met him yet. So, well he's wonderful yeah. as you know of course he's a wonderful writer and um, has some of the most enduring fly fishing poetry, I believe, of our time. Um, his most recent collection is the Mad, includes the Mad Angler poems, and a lot of us are becoming mad anglers at the, <laughs> at the state of the world and what's happening to our rivers. So, yeah, all those all those Delpian manifestos, right? All the dream, all the dreamscapes. It's a it's a yeah, it's a you know one of the I just think about you know, regionally that as a, as a reader, I love the fact that I can, you know, read a book by, by like Michael or you. And then I'm, I'm on, uh, I'm, I've never fished a Michigan river, but I'm on a, a Michigan river. I can understand them. I feel the, I, they're different, right. Than some of these topsy turvy rivers of the West and uh, just nice to be able to transport there. So yeah, someday, someday I hope to, fish with Delp. Yep. All right, good. We'll get you out here. Yeah. Uh, I'm, well, I'd love to hear you read. If you got something you'd, from from new book or from other work that you'd like to share? Sure, sure. Uh, I figured I'd just, there's, I'd, I'd like to, there's two, um, two poets I'd like to uh, just read one poem from each of them uh, just to start off with. I always think it's important. And um, there's two, there's two kind of fly fishing poets uh, or just outdoor poets that I've been reading recently. The first one is uh, Michael Garrigan, uh, his book, Robbing the Pillars. And then uh, Jory Mickelson, uh, Wilder Wilderness Kingdom. And uh, I'm just gonna share really briefly two poems there. And it, it just, it really just demonstrates, I guess, that rooting in place or that, that uh, different ways that poets encompass places where they are. This poem is called Montana. This is by Jory. All my life I've been level-headed because I grew up knowing, knowing horizon. Sky as baseline, prairie as high watermark. The songs my body knows, the sound of seed head and grass stalk stirring in the air, the endless chink chink of irrigation pipe and sprinkler head, the rise of a meadow lark's impossible call, gravel troubled under tires, paintings done with light and cloud across canvases of alfalfa, hay, and wheat, long brush strokes of storm front and the stiff scrumblings of hail, 
all marks are horizontal. Montana exceeds all harvest and machinations. It rises sudden in the chest, a crow that calmly tilts until the farmer's thresher comes to rest in that flat expanse, that graded wind. Uh, so that's Jory and he kind of encompasses those big uh, basin ranges of Montana. Kind of reminded me of Richard Hugo when I was reading it a little bit. And the other one, uh, this is kind of, again, how we were talking, this kind of transported, this book transported me to the Southeast. Again, a place where I haven't really done any, any trout fishing. And this poem uh, by Michael Garrigan, How to Listen to a River. The complexity of a riffle, the puzzle of granite boulders, the down poplar, the swallow on the branch overhanging the bank. What you see is a clue as to what you'll hear, but close your eyes at some point, hopefully with water running over your ankles and feel the weight of the downstream pull and how you sink into the pebbled stream bed. It is an all-encompassing sound, this river. So just two, two young up-and-coming poets who I've really enjoyed their work. Um, figured I'd just get started with those. I think uh, I've, I've had a lot of different mentors in my lifetime and I always, uh, I can't rightly remember who it was, but they always said, Cam, you should always read somebody else's poem uh, before you read your own, just to give a nod. So I, it's a hard, it's a habit I, I have developed and I really appreciate and uh, enjoy. I like, I like just sharing other people's poetry. So, um, so this book, Watershed here, uh, I guess just a couple shout outs I'd really like. If you guys can see the beautiful cover there, that artwork is Helen Gottlieb and she's a She's an artist. She's a print artist, I believe in Michigan, in your neck of the woods. And uh, um, just was really grateful that she um, provided some of her art for this book. And then of course, Jill Peak over at Alice Green Company. Um, I think the, this manuscript, like a lot of poets, I'd sent it out to over 50 places with 50 rejections with a lot of wild stories in between publishers sending emails that I wasn't supposed to read. Um, and uh, just really grateful that it found a home, I guess, with Alice Green Company. So thank you, Jill and Colin. Uh, because it is a holiday today, um, and a really important one, MLK uh, Day, I wanted to start off with a poem called Colorado Trespass. And there was always a quote at the beginning of this poem. It didn't make it to the, to the final production. But one writing conference in Colorado, in Salida, there is a Colorado Supreme Court Justice, Greg Hobbs. And he was a huge water advocate. And I remember having a conversation with him saying, Justice Hobbs, when, when will I ever be able to just fish any water I want in Colorado? Because, you know, over the course of my lifetime, there were places that I would fish that, uh, you know, were bought by other people who decided they really didn't like easements or wanted the property to be private or, you know, all, all different types of reasons why, but all of a sudden, little by little, water that I really enjoyed fishing uh, became private. And uh, I said, Justice Hobbs, when will, when will I ever just be able to go fish Colorado water like Montana? He said, well, I can't answer that question, but Martin Luther King has a really great quote um, about that. And the arc of the moral universe is long, right? And eventually it'll bend toward justice. Mm -hmm. I, always, I always thought about that as far as, you know, rivers, the way rivers, the way rivers move, um, you know, and, and during this, crazy, crazy year. Um, uh, oftentimes I just think about how similar, I think about rivers that I know and how similar the year is moving to some of those rivers, um, just with plunge pools and rapids and 
going one direction, going another direction, and totally going off somewhere that you don't necessarily expect. So this is called Colorado Trespass. Driving home from fishing, someone mentions wanting to win the lottery. I nod my head, imagining deep bends and cliff walls, jade green, all to myself. Friends dropping in, refrigerator stocked full of beer, sitting on the porch as countless stars emerge. But this is not my dream and is not your dream. We are already too late and navigate a country of second homes and fenced off land. Arriba, abajo, afuera, al dentro. Soft indentations, flattened grass, barbed wire strung between desire and despair. That's for MLK right there. Yeah. Just thinking about uh, Colorado rivers and rivers everywhere that that I would like to fish. So um, this uh, this collection of poetry, um, every I like to think about books of poetry kind of as uh, old record albums, um, and there's usually some type of arc to them. Uh, the beginning and, and a middle and an end. So where, you know, in a book, you might have that and actions driving it in a collection of poetry, maybe the poems themselves are waypoints in this arc, in this collection. Uh, Colorado Trespass uh, takes place kind of at the end of this collection. I'll read uh, the very first poem in the collection called Blackberries Revisited. And again, just as a reader and a writer, I've read so many poems about blackberries over time. Uh, Robert Haas has a pretty powerful blackberry poem. That's exactly who I was thinking of, that, that, that very poem, yeah. And, uh, but he's not the only one, right? And so sometimes, especially in days like, where sometimes I'll just try to do a response to a poem uh, or continue on a conversation. I think a lot of times it's like a conversation that continues in poetry, in music, you see conversations continuing on and on through time as well. Sometimes, especially in hip hop, there will be phrases and conversations that are continued. So this is just, this is called Blackberries Revisited. I do not have a way with blackberries, lines thick enough to entrap, thorns, a chamber of chaos to dive into for sweetness, but never to dive out of the same way. Impossible to remain untouched, whisper marks on soft flesh, backs of hands, pricks of scarlet, among the accumulation of memories, these deep purple stains. And so that's kind of a, uh, an anchor, I guess, uh, for watershed. There's blackberries for me, especially out, out in the Pacific Northwest, they're everywhere. Um, and the Steelhead Rivers where I really enjoy fishing and the rivers where I grew up on the west side as well. And then I go to a place like Colorado where it's not blackberries that are all over the place. It's like poison ivy or poison oak. And so uh, it, it very much just felt like a, a rooting or a place to start uh, when thinking about a watershed. You know, those moments when you're not fishing or you're in the middle of the day and those blackberries are just sitting there whispering to you. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm just gonna yeah. say that it, the the poem and and that thought um, makes me think of one of my favorite poets who happened to be a fly fisherman, Jim Harrison. Yes, um, yep. probably my favorite poem poet of all time, in fact. And I know his work better than any other poets. And he doesn't write often, or he didn't write often. It's the late Jim Harrison. He didn't write often about um, directly about fly fishing. Um, but it was an element of, of a lot of, of his work, um, po poetry and prose. And it always intrigued me how reading one of his poems, you, you entered the poem 
you entered the place he was writing about, and you entered his very interesting and unique mind. And you saw those associations one right after another as he went down the river, for instance, and what he was seeing, and then the then the asides that it took him on, the, the lines of thought that it took him on were fascinating, always fascinating. He, he was a brilliant, wonderful writer. I yes. know you know him. I, his yes. work. Yeah, I, I, you know, definitely. And I, I, there's like a gutsiness there with Harrison that I always really enjoyed. Just wasn't afraid to drink whatever was handed to him or eat whatever was handed to him. You know, he just really just, you know, his po in his poems, like small gods, the poems in there, for instance, it, he's a poet that I really like to teach to my um, high schoolers. Oh, just feel like they're in a place where they're very receptive to, to, to Harrison and his poems. Yeah. Um, there's a, a lot of these poems in this collection, you know, as writers, uh, it's always really wonderful finding editors, I guess, that like our work. It's the, it's one of the joys of being a writer, um, you know, sending it off all, all different kinds of places and then it sticks somewhere. And sometimes it doesn't just stick somewhere, but uh, there's an editor who really enjoys what you're doing. And so uh, most of these poems were published in a fly fishing magazine called the Fly Fish Journal. And over the years, it was, it was kind of like one of the first big publications, I guess, that I got that was outside of the, the kind of literary journal scope. And, you know, I got a check and could go buy some beer and have a burger um, from writing a poem. And I really appreciated the number of fly fishing magazines out there. It just seems like every time I turn, there's another fly fishing magazine um, that's being made. And they're all just these labors of love. And so just thank you to the Drake, the Fly Fish Journal. Fly Fishing and Tying Journal, um, Swing, The Fly Magazine, uh, Tail Fly Fishing. I mean, all of these, I mean, it just goes on and on. And, you know, Fly Fishermen, it's all of these things. And the ones that really kind of bend towards the literary, I really appreciate, I guess, because there, until that happened, there wasn't really a place to, to publish, right? Grays, for example, another great one. Um, and so thank you to all those literary journals, especially the Fly Fish Journal for uh, giving a lot of these poems at home. Uh, this, this, um, this was one of the first, I was always really sneaky as a writer. And so uh, with the Fly Fish Journal, they had this online site for many, many years where you could post as a contributor. And I had a really, uh, a, one of my good friends, Kopi Boita, is the photography editor of the Fly Fish Journal now, but he wasn't. At one point, you know, we just were both living in the Roaring Fork Valley. He was working at one fly shop. I was working at like the evil competitor fly shop and um, we would go fishing and things like that. And uh, when he, like I started getting a little bit of work into the Fly Fish Journal, but I always wanted to give them poems, but they always, were more interested in lyrical essays. And so I snuck in a, a, two poems into a lyrical essay about teaching in a place called Chiloquin, Oregon. And Chiloquin is uh, in South Central Oregon. It's a place where um, there's been all kinds of things that have happened there. It's, it was tribal land, the, the tribe sold their tribal land off. It's just a rough, it's a rough place with really wonderful kiddos. And so I'd written this lyrical essay about fishing and the students of Chiloquin, Oregon, and submitted it to the Flatfish Journal, but snuck a couple poems in there and they, they kept the poems within this, within this lyrical piece. So this was, this was one of them. So this is kind of an ode to the, the students at, in Chiloquin. Big fish, little ditch. When I ate my first vertebrae, it was a mistake. All guts and instinct. The little bugger flashed right in front of my face. How often do I eat other fish? I mean, sometimes it just happens. And bugs? 
Sometimes I eat them just to remember. But mice, mice do it for me. And frogs, the occasional snake. I tried to eat a baby duck once, but it didn't work out. Hey, I do what I want. I stay up late and sleep all day. When the ice thickens and there isn't much happening, I just sit in the silt and contemplate the meaning of it all. What? No, I've never been farther downstream. I'm all there is around here. Um, uh, wonderful. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, uh, there's been a trifecta for me throughout life and it's been teaching and fly fishing and poetry. And so a lot of times I I'm inspired, I guess, by the people that I meet and oftentimes they're as often kids as they are, you know, crusty river guides. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry, were there any poems in particular that, that struck you in this collection, I guess, or that maybe I could read one for you? Well, the, the one from the point of view of the big old trout was definitely one I was going to bring that up. I also really liked Driver on page eight. Awesome. So, so much, so much of fly fishing. I think it was like maybe Steve Raymond or Roderick Haig Brown, but an essayist. I just remember thinking once when I was reading them that there's, there are all these transitions that a, that a fly fishing person will go through in life, right? You go from the, I just want to catch a trout. Please just give me one trout to I want to catch as many trout as I can. I want to catch the biggest trout that I can. I want to catch the strangest, most outlandish fish that I can. And um, at a certain point for me, I got to a place where I loved steelhead fishing because it meant I wasn't probably going to catch any fish. And so this is a poem about that. So much of, so much of, of fly fishing for me in the wintertime in my 30s and coming into my 40s now has been focused on steelhead fishing. So driver. Always downstream when fall light runs cold. Sometimes a steelhead breaks the surface like a brick through window and water shatters as if some small god got its head stuck briefly somewhere it shouldn't be. Body whipping like a turban. Dusk's dead glow begins to flicker Cold coils of the electric road redden, a crown of celestial light where once there were darkening trees. Conduit, intermediary, mouthpiece. Each steelhead a letter written in longhand, an invitation to turn loose, to set free, and bushwhack through rose hips, red osier, and blackberry vines. Whitefish, bull trout, smolt all day until headlights slash past, each as impossible to recall as the last, until a steelhead waiting in the darkening parking lot of Log Jam is there to drive me home. It makes me think of, um, of how, how wrong people are to think that the appeal of fly fishing is is just the romance of it or, or the snob element of it. Um, you know, of course there are examples of that to be found, but primarily I, I think what that poem tells me is that the attention to detail uh, in fly fishing is what draws so many poets to it. It takes the same kind of perceptiveness and atten attentiveness in, in being present, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and when you enter that state, you can't help but start noticing everything around you and notice or more around you. We miss so much, of course, every moment, but you notice more than you ordinarily would. That deep concentration that comes from staring at the river or, or pursuing one fish in particular that you can see or just being dialed in for a day in a, in a float in a drift boat casting cast after cast that the rhythm of that the the rhythm of casting can be compared to the rhythm of a poem the lines flowing one after another like a meandering line 
Um, I just see a lot of those really important elements in that poem and, and the entire book. This is not just about fishing. It's not just about um, fish and, and catching. It's not at, at all really about catching them. And the best, the best angling literature of all, all you know, from, ang from you know, the earliest examples to now are not really about fishing, you know. There's, you know, the other, the other thought that I have in that poem is, is I, I think I'd probably, I think I just uh, read through Harrison's uh, Small Gods and I couldn't resist, but like sneak that into that poem when thinking about, about those fish and, you know, just that history. I think one of my favorite things, Marvin Bell, who was such a wonderful poet, um, he recently passed away and I remember him saying one time, you know, you really need to learn everything you can about the thing that you love so that you can break the rules, right? So everyone who writes in the fly fishing sphere, you know, all of us, the, all this reading that we do, it kind of allows you to know what rules there are to be broken, right? To not write about fish. I mean, one of the first rules I really every single poem was about catching a fish at the beginning. Right. And then just figuring out that you can break that rule and um, talk about other things and all of these really wonderful fly fishing writers. Um, I guess I love the fact that they all break, they all build in different ways, right? They're all doing different things. And then the, the last thing Marvin said, you said you, you have to know the rules, you have to break them and make your own. And then the most important part probably was he said, then you have to break your own rules. Yeah. You have to break those even, right? And that, that process, I guess, is just that process of being in the generative space. It's so important. Um, being on the river, being present in the river, it's so important. It's also just as important to take that afternoon nat or, uh, nap when the hatch dies, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a rule break. If you're in the fly fishing world, right? I just remember I would fish from dawn until dusk every day, just lights out just all day. And uh, Kopi was the first person I ever ran into. <laughs> just like midday, the hatch died. And I was standing out there and I was like, where the heck did he go? And he was over just cashed out in the bank grass. <laughs> you know, I think of Michael Delt just all of his deck poems sitting on the deck not fishing just watching right all those river deck poems and so um just a, a nod i guess to marvin bell and just the generative nature of of what we do in that in the fly fishing literary literature scope um it's always wonderful being a reader let, let me ask you a question then as one reader to another. Um, do you know any women who write about fly fishing? Oh, yeah. Who write I know a lot of them who write prose, essays and, and other nonfiction, and probably fiction as well, but, but poetry. Yeah, I mean, Erin uh, Block, she, she threw down her uh, a poem the other day. I really enjoyed it. And there aren't many. I don't know why being a poet, I guess, in the poetry spheres, there are all kinds of poems about fish. Sandra Alcoser has an entire book called A Fish to Feed All Hunger. And it's brilliant to watch her recite um, poems from that book. Uh, but not necessarily, they're not necessarily about fishing in the sense that there's so many there's been this huge, ex, ex, brilliant, ex, expanding universe of accessibility to fly fishing for, for people. And uh, there's all kinds of wonderful female writers. But, you know, I think the, the poem, in a lot of the lyrical prose, like Bridget Moran, a lot of times I'm just in the back of my head, I'm like, you know, she's really writing a poem in this mm -hmm. piece even though it's reading as prose um, in other, other authors, you know, it's that crossover between 
really good prose always reads like a poem, I think. Um, but hopefully there will be hopefully more. And I always am, uh, there's such a huge expanding outward, I guess, of the fly fishing industry being in the industry right now. Um, you know, if you follow the almighty dollar so much of, uh, different companies are focused on catering towards female fly fishermen. Finally. Well, yeah. They're more fishing every year. More, they're the fastest growing segment of the whole industry. I've yeah. read. I, so, I, yeah. I asked my friend, Bob DeMott, who's a, who's also a wonderful poet who writes frequently about, about fishing. I asked him the question about women and he said, he recommended Dolores Hayden. Do you know her work? I do not. I'm writing that down. I, I don't either. And I just got, I just didn't think to ask him that in time to look her up, but that's one I'm going to follow up on. Awesome. So, and how about Chris Dombrowski? You, you might even know him. Do you <laughs> a fellow fishing guide slash poet? You know, I've never met, I've never gotten to meet Chris yet. Uh, I really would like to meet Chris and have a beer with him someday. A lot of times I've, I've found myself really in Colorado, mostly in kind of literary communities on the west side of Colorado on the West Slope. And then out here, just communities driven by the Fly Fish Journal and really wonderful writers um, with them, but Chris, it's always been a running joke. I, I heard about Chris Dombrowski like so long ago now. Um, I think from Sandra Alcoster, she was like, Cam, there's this fly fishing poet. You have to, you have to connect up with him. And for, for whatever reason, you know, guiding seasons, he's a guide too. And guiding seasons when you're guiding, that's kind of all that exists in the world. Right. And so uh, just, you know, off, I did finally go through, I guided in Oregon for the first time this last year and didn't go back to Colorado and in, uh, in when the water gets really warm on the Grand Ronde, you know, trips were, trips were shutting down. I was like, perfect. And so Haley and I and the dogs went on a huge circuit through up the Lockshaw down in the Bitterroot. And when I was down there, I was hoping that I was going to catch up with him. You know, Missoula is such a hot spot for, for writers and, yeah. Um, but he was off, of course, eight hours away on a different river. <laughs> it's pretty great having a long running list actually of, of, of writer fishers that, you know, I'd like to meet. Yeah. 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 They tend to be a pretty, pretty good group. Um, yeah. one I recommend is a Michigan, a fellow Michigan guy, Robert Haight, H-A-I-G-H-T. Um, his, book emergences and spinner falls is is wonderful and and i'm reading the the galley proofs now of his new collection which will be coming out this fall called shimmer awesome well guiding is not an easy way to make a living i did it for a year once and i had fun it was it was certainly interesting but boy, those days are long. <laughs> and I just, and I, I didn't have any time to do my own fishing or writing. And so I, I, I did it long enough to get a, a, an essay out of it. And I, I said, okay, this is not for me. <laughs> but you, I can tell by your, your demeanor and by um, the comments on your webpage that you really like it, that it's, it's great fun for you. It was, it was a natural it was, teacher, I'm guessing it's teaching just as much as classroom teaching. It is. And, you know, I think most guides will say it eventually your clients just become friends. You know, my, a lot of my clients just over time became just really good friends and um, it's hard work for sure. And I think there's a, there's a factor. I just have so much respect. So for like a big chunk of time, I started off in, in one fly shop called Dragonfly Anglers in Crested Butte in Colorado. And worked in the shop and guided for two years there. And then went to a place called Taylor Creek in the Roaring Fork Valley. And there's like 30 of the most of the hardest working guides, you know, who will guide all day and then they'll go out crawdad fishing all night and <laughs> come back the next day and keep guiding. I mean, just such a really great group of, uh, fishing guides, you know, and, um, you know, for me, eventually, uh, 
I guess the really nice, it was, it's so many people. Um, it's one thing I think that the fly fishing industry is contending with, or I guess I contend with is that aspect of, of also loving fish so much that I'm like, when there's just unlimited amounts of pressure on fish, what does that do? And for me, it just really wore me out. It wasn't the clients or, you know, working 60 straight days. It was just seeing like when I saw that same fish end up in my net for like the seventh time in the mm -hmm. summer, I just, it did something. And so, um, I guess I feel really, I'd really like to guide my whole life because I really do enjoy it. And being out here in Oregon now, you know, there are times when so many, so many days I'm the only boat on the river. And, uh, even during, you know, very busy times, the rivers are very big, you know, the Grand Ronde river, it's very big. It's a four day wilderness float. And there are a lot of guides on it during peak season, but it's such a different feel for me than Colorado, where I was always hemmed in. Here was my 20 yards on the frying pan river that I had to work with for half a day, you know, and I loved working with the clients, but it was just seeing those, those, those same fish. I just did something. So that, um, you know, uh, Barry Lopez, um, had a talk once and he just said, there's so few places that where I, cause he's been, he was, he went, he went all over the world. He's and he, I remember him talking once and he said, there's so few places where people haven't been. You think you're in the middle of nowhere and you look down and there's a rusted tin can you're in the middle of the Arctic or Siberia. And, um, so much of what I enjoy about fly fishing is just the wildness of it. And I enjoy sharing that with clients. And so in Colorado, I was always the guide uh, going to those very strange places, right. Making my clients bushwhack and climb over rocks and scree piles. Um, so I think that that transition to, to being in a little bit wilder place for however many knock on wood years at last has been really nice. There's a, um, there's a kind of a prose lyrical essay in this collection called guiding mom that is one of my favorite things I've ever written because A, it was about my mom and it was also about guiding without being about guiding. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think that that true, true guides really do just enjoy fishing with, fishing with, you know, all kinds of folks. And for me, that really, taking my mom fishing is kind of the, the silliest thing I can possibly do. And she loves it. And it's-, it's I, I love just, that piece. And I have to say, you've got a very cool mom. Yes, yeah, 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 yep. And colorful. <laughs> yes, very colorful, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if there is uh, necessarily time to read that piece, but um, maybe John, if there aren't any, uh, questions coming through, maybe I could read that piece or are there any questions coming through? Yeah, I think you should read that piece. Um, the only question we have right now is, is asking for, uh, our friend, the poet Holly Ren Spalding would like Jerry to read something as well. So maybe you could read that piece and then Jerry could read something to, to close this out. If, if that works for both of you. Perfect. Yes. All right. Guiding mom. Your mom wants in, newly retired from working for the state children's social welfare services, you owe her. Hell, society owes her. But being a mom, you know she has never really gotten her due. She's never asked for anything except to spend time with you, and this is it. Of all the scenarios you can think of that would be the most difficult, you have offered to drive around the dusty interior west during late April and May for a nine-day road trip. Mom knows you're a fishing guide and have spent all of your money in the pursuit of fish. And so when she visits, she brings you things to supplement your diet of Pap's Blue Ribbon, dried mangoes, homemade granola, and cookies, and takes you out to dinner. And while it was your dad who brought you your first pair of waders, it was mom who took a class on how to make a wooden net from scratch and did just that, giving it to you one Christmas. Couched beneath it all, 
is the simple fact that your mom is the only person in the entire world that makes you wonder if you aren't just an overgrown 12 year old who spends all day down at the creek looking for crawdads and dunking worms. She has an alarming way of seeing past your grizzled facial hair, gas guzzling truck and new girlfriend or fly rod every four months habit. It all makes you wonder if ever so briefly that if you'd become an ad exec like your cousin, you'd be the one taking her out to dinner during off season. Heck, even if you had done something halfway respectable, like gotten married, you'd feel more like an adult when mom is around. The main problem tenting together on a river in far, far Eastern Oregon for a few days isn't that mom snores a little bit or uses up the entire pack of baby wipes in two days. She's better than most fishing buddies and doesn't even complain about eating out of the same pot of food or sharing a spoon. You even start to suspect she is as big of a dirt bag as you. The main problem about fishing with mom is that she doesn't care if you have the entire psychological playbook at your fingertips and know who is fishing what on what stretch of river. She doesn't care if you can set up a rig guaranteed to set the hook on even the most stubborn rock that magically turns into a fish. The main problem is that she does things like try to feed you lunch in the middle of epic caddis hatches and refuses to talk to the shop guys about the rental boots she's trying on and instead yells to you across the fly shop and asks how they should fit. Then it happens. Even though the weather takes a turn for the worse and it snows in the flaming gorge, you are with mom. So instead of spending a night knocking snow from the tent and shivering in your sleeping bag, you find yourself in a hotel room with a hot shower. While neither you nor mom have completely lost your dirt bagginess, microwaving corn tortillas with cheese for dinner, you tie flies until midnight, contemplating how nice it is to spend the night in a warm room instead of shivering in your sleeping bag. Each afternoon, she gains more confidence, and although there are times she returns with a flyless leader blowing in the wind and wants to break your fly rod over her knee during the dry fly hatches when fish rise just out of reach, she wanders back into camp two hours late with a big smile on her face. She talks to everyone on the river and makes friends. Maybe, you think, you could learn a thing or two about fly fishing from her. By the time you end the trip in Colorado, she fishes on her own. Although you're sick of catching trout for eight days in a row, you aren't tired of fishing with her. Halfway through the trip, she starts to pick up tanks of gas. She asks questions about rivers, cooks on the Coleman, and slams down road food so she can get on the river. And although she doesn't do anything as disgusting as sample the deep fried bean burritos at the Shell Station in Vernal, Utah, she's officially in. Even without the grizzled facial hair, she's in, even with the pink, pair of polarized sunglasses she picked up, she's in. Purple rain pants, in. Nightly glasses of white wine, in. Plastic Ziploc bags full of prunes, in. Not that you'd suggest it, but everybody should take mom fishing. Well, I do have one I'd like to read. It's very short. It's part of a suite of poems about a particular river. Um, so it doesn't have a title. Get some light on it. In a tail out slick as window pane, a trout breaks the surface tenderly, a fingertip testing the air to see if it is lethal. I cast my counterfeit ephemeron and watch it ride the current so delicate and treacherous. The trout ignores it. I'm fine with that. We love all things that break the surface. <laughs> That's awesome. it. Nice well, work, Terry. It's been great, Cam. I really hope we can get on the water together and in a, so, in, at a poetry reading together someday. That would be brilliant. It's been great meeting you too, Jerry. We'd love to have you both uh, at Literati Bookstore. Uh, Mike Thalp is here. He's, he's been, uh, he said he was clapping wildly from home. <laughs> uh, to welcome you both and wants to send his best um but yeah thank you so much for being here cameron scott jerry dennis of course you can buy watershed at literati bookstore there's a link in the chat there's a link in the description below as well if you're watching us later on youtube i hope you both continue to stay safe and be well and um get some warmer weather soon and have some some good fishing weather soon and um uh, and have you in the store soon as well. But until then, continue to, to, to be well. And to all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you all at the next event. So take care, everybody. Good night, all. Bye-bye.